Hi everybody, this is Solomon Schmidt from History Bites. I'm very excited to be here today with Professor Verlin Flieger, who is one of the greatest scholars on J.R.R. Tolkien and British literature. As a professor for almost four decades, she has written several books on Tolkien and traveled to several countries to speak at conferences on Tolkien. Dr. Professor Flieger, thank you very much for coming on the History Bites YouTube channel. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. So, how many books do you think you have on Tolkien? How many how books do you many? think you own? I don't know. I've never counted. <laughs> um, Too many to count? Oh, maybe 300. So, Professor Flieger, when, when and where were you born? <laughs> I was born in 1933 at the bottom of the Depression in Hanover, Pennsylvania. But that was just the nearest hospital. It wasn't my hometown. And where was your hometown? It was the Depression, so I really didn't have one. We moved around a lot. I guess Arlington, Virginia. Okay. But Kansas City, Spokane, Washington, Westminster, Maryland, they all came in for some. But your parents moved to find work. My dad moved where he was told to go. He worked for the government and he was lucky to have a job. Right. So if they said, we're transferring you to Kansas City, we picked up and moved to Kansas City. And when did you first read Tolkien's books and become interested in studying his life? 1956. And did you read The Lord of the Rings? I read The Lord of the Rings. I was working at the Folger Shakespeare Library in downtown DC. And one of my co-workers was British and had just received from her brother in England this three volume set that nobody had ever heard of, right? but that apparently people in England were really thinking was hot stuff. So she passed it around the acquisitions office, the catalog office, uh, upstairs and downstairs. We all read it and we all thought it was just wonderful. Um, but that was kind of the be all and end all. I didn't think at that time about trying to do anything with it, right. but just appreciate it. Enjoy it as the story. And that would have been, 56 was just one year after The Return of the King, the third volume in the yeah. series was published. And so how long after that did you start to develop an academic interest in Tolkien? About eight or ten years later when my oldest son got poison ivy hmm. and was confined at home. His face was swollen mm -hmm. to the size of a soccer ball and he had no eyes. Oof. And so I began to read to him. And the book on top of the pile was The Fellowship of the Ring and I simply opened it and said, when Mr. Bilbo Baggins of Bag End Hobbiton and started to read and he was hooked, my other two kids were hooked, we read through the whole set that summer. And I was at the time in graduate school and fortunate enough to be a teaching assistant, a fellowship. And I was teaching a genre course in satire. Okay, satire and I, literature? Satire and literature, Swift, Pope, Orwell, you know. Right. Uh, and it was so much fun that I thought, I bet these students would like a course in fantasy. So I proposed it. It was accepted. And this was the early 70s by now. They had more students registered than they could accommodate. They had to add on extra sections, um, and we were off. Of course, for me, it was just an excuse to teach the Lord of the Rings. Okay. I padded it with other fantasies, but that was the heart of it. Right. 
And you said a minute ago they had so many students. Was that, you said early 70s, was that an influx of young people returning from Vietnam? From no, the Vietnam no, War? it wasn't particularly. When I said so many students, I yes. met students interested in Tolkien. In Tolkien, okay. And why do you think Tolkien became so popular in the 1960s and early, around that time period in the United States? Because he's good. <laughs> right, good That's story. That's a question that we all get asked. Uh, and the mystery is very simple. It's a marvelously good book. I think that it did also dovetail with the sort of awakening consciousness in the 60s and early 70s. The, the 70s hippies. were really the 60s. Okay. Um, that there was a new, oh, how do I want to put this? There was a new consciousness of, um, of war and of the consequences of war, of the effect on people's lives, of the idea that little people, I mean, hobbits are little people, uh, that the traditional little man uh, could, could affect big events. But mostly it's just because it's a good book. It's well written, it's well plotted, the characters are fascinating, and the whole idea is riveting. Yes, and, and Tolkien said in, in interviews that he always thought that an important message or theme was that the seemingly small or little people, yes. seemingly, um, in life, are often the people that make the most difference uh, to their friends, to their family, and that there's a line in The Lord of the Rings, you know it, at, at the Council of Elrond, in the Fellowship of the Ring, Elrond. where Elrond the Elf talks about how the eyes of the great people, the, the yes. people in power, are elsewhere while the smaller people like Frodo and Sam and the hobbits are the ones orchestrating. Um, Small hands turn the wheels of the world right. while the eyes of the great are elsewhere. Yeah. Right. And, and they're not just seemingly little people, they really are. And I think that was important to him. That, that hobbits are, are apt to be overlooked that you look beyond the little. Uh, and he wanted to fix his reader's gaze on what was right around. Right. That the loyalty of Samwise Gamgee, who is three foot eight or whatever, is just as great and heroic as Aragorn, a man leading I troops into battle. I would say it's even better. Because Sam has no status, no right. great Nothing. identity, no Nothing particular to gain. social obligations. Right. He just does what he knows he has to do. Right. And that's what so many in, in Tolkien's generation did in, in World War One. Yes. And of course during during every other war, but especially World War One. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Uh, do you have a favorite character from The Lord of the Rings? Frodo. Frodo. And and why Frodo? because he moves me so deeply, because his story is, the arc of it is tragedy, um, because he does a wonderful thing, even though he can't quite bring it off, uh, and sacrifices his whole life to do it. I don't, see, I get asked that question a lot, mm -hmm. and to me it's a no-brainer. Who else would I like? He is the heart of the story. Now if you want a character, as in good character, interesting, funny, creativity, right. I would pick Boromir. A tragic who, hero. Who is double-sided. Right. Uh, and for that reason, um, much more complex and much more interesting. Because there's a struggle between choosing the ring and power over doing what he knows is right and helping his friends on the quest to destroy the ring. 
instead well, of taking it for himself. That, of course, is also Frodo's struggle. Right. Especially in the book. And so you said it was your interest in Tolkien that prompted you to start the academic course on yeah. fantasy. Uh -huh. And you mentioned your doctorate program. What did you get your doctorate degree in? Because Tolkien was of little worth in academia at that time, I got my degree in modern British literature. It was The Lord of the Rings, right. which was written <laughs> as a modern British novel. Right. Uh, but that was really kind of a screen. A cover? A cover yes. that the English department felt it needed to legitimize what I was doing. Okay. And what, what university did you become a professor at? Oh, the University of Maryland. And how, how long did you teach there? I went there in 76, and I left in 2012, so 36 years or so. And you enjoyed your time uh, teaching I especially? It. I loved it. It was, I, I found my calling. In, in teaching in the classroom setting? In the classroom setting, yes. I just loved it. I wanted it to go on forever. And so, in 1983, you published your first book on Tolkien, which is Splintered Light, Logos and Language in Tolkien's World, and there's a link for you to learn more about Professor Flieger in the section below this video, and also a link for you to buy this book. It is a phenomenal book on Tolkien, and if you want to understand him and his world better, highly recommend you read this book. It's still in print after 40 years. Um, so. Can you explain, Professor Flieger, what this title, Splintered Light, means? What does it mean in relation to Tolkien and his books? Well, it means, for one thing, the thing that happens to the light spectrum when it goes through a prism. The white light breaks up into all the colors. Of the rainbow. And it's the image that Tolkien used in his poem, Mythopoeia, which he wrote to explain things to C.S. Lewis in which he talks about the light through whom man's sub-creator, human beings, the, oh gosh, I can't remember it, the, through whom the light is splintered from a single white to many hues and endlessly combined in moving shapes that move from mind to mind. Uh, I thought the notion of the, the whole light mm -hmm. and the broken up light, the splintered light, which is what we see after all most of the time, uh, was just nailed it for me. Now what does he mean by the whole light? Was he referring to someone or something? when He, he was referring light. to white light, to a beam of sunlight. Um, which, when it is passed through the prism, breaks up into the rainbow spectrum. And he did the same thing with language, that his languages, his invented languages, broke up into various tongues, just as human languages do. So I saw that there was a correlation which I thought he had built in between light and language. Logos, okay. the word. The word. Yeah. Light. And, and light. Logos, the word. Yeah. And so, when you talk about his languages being the thing that is splintered, what, what do you believe is the white light for Tolkien? If his languages are the splintered portion of the light. Did you have a correlation to what that white light is for Tolkien? The word. The word. Meaning in... In the beginning was the word. In a religious or linguistic sense or, or both? I think in a linguistic sense, okay. largely. In a language yes. sense. Yeah. Right. Just the word, the miracle that human beings can bring into existence the things they see around them, 
by giving them names. It's what Adam does with the beasts. Right, in, in, the, in the Bible. Yeah. Right? And, and for Tolkien, he was so unique this way, as you know, because while, while there may be a lot of people who learn a second language, he loved language almost like some people would love a sport or a hobby. Creating, yes. he was very, like, like you know well, very unique in that way that he, he loved making up languages because he loved hearing the sound of words. And I think, and I'd like to get your opinion, do you believe his love of languages is what most inspired his creation of Middle Earth above anything? I'm not sure. I think, well, he said himself right. that it started with language. And from a very early age, he had been used to making up languages, like little kids speak Pig Latin. Uh, and he had animalic, in which all nouns were converted to the names of animals. That he and his cousins made up, yes. is that right? Yep. Uh huh. Uh, and one called Nevbosh. <laughs> uh, but he was just playing around with with the relationship of the thing to its name and the kind of magic that you can work if you have control of the name. And then he read Kalevala. And what is Kalevala? <laughs> Kalevala is the Finnish mythology. Tolkien read it I think when he was at King Edward School. So school in the early friend, 1900s. Yeah, had okay. uh, recommended it. The Kirby English translation was just out. And Tolkien read it and was simply blown away. He immediately <laughs> tried to teach himself Finnish so he could read it in the original. Well, he couldn't. You can't teach yourself. A very I, difficult. I tried. Okay. It's got 32 cases. <laughs> it's got prefixes, suffixes, infixes. It has no gendered pronouns. Um, it's an extremely complicated language, but it was the thing that got Tolkien thinking about the real relationship between language and mythology. And my favorite quote from on fairy stories. An essay Tolkien wrote. Well, on an essay that Tolkien wrote on, on the drafts of the essay. Okay. Uh, he said, mythology is language and language is mythology. Full stop. Period. That's it. And that, that explains ties his stories to languages, to the creation of stories. Elvish and Dwarvish and all the languages that even you see in the movies too. Well, um, not, of course, beginning in the books and in Tolkien's own writings, but then carried over into the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit movies. Um, so it, it's all, all tied back to language. Well, I would make a distinction between the Elvish that's in the movies, which is dialogue made up for the film. Right. And Tolkien's languages, which had no part in that. And of course, he had a whole working Elvish language. Oh, Sindara he had. And Quenya. He had finally, I think, in all 12 fully developed languages. By fully developed, I mean with syntax and rules of grammar. Uh, Quenya, which was inspired by Finnish. Sindarin, which was modeled on Welsh. But then Taliska, Goldebrin, um, any number of spin-offs, not to mention Entish, Orkish, Dwarvish, right. and the uh, common speech which is presumed to be a translation into English of Hobbitish. <laughs> so very complex. Yes. But for this whole developed world of 
Middle Earth. And so you are you you discussed that theme of the word and language in your book Splintered Light. But then another book that you wrote, um, 2005, it was published, Interrupted Music, The Making of Tolkien's Mythology. Again, there's a link for this book uh, below this video. Thanks for the plug. <laughs> You're welcome. So, can you explain, again, this is a very, very unique set of words, like splintered light, interrupted music. How is this title, how is it connected to Tolkien and his world? What, what connection does it have to the making of Tolkien's mythology? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, his whole mythology, of which the Lord of the Rings is only a part, uh, which he called the Silmarillion, began in 1917 and was still being worked on when he died in 1973. But the, the overarching idea of it is that the world was brought into being, the created universe, um, by means of music, that the godhead, Eru, um, gives to the offspring of his thought. So they're all, in a sense, splinters of him. Right. Um, a theme, a musical theme, da 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 da, or whatever you like, mm -hmm. and says, take it and run with it. Make for me a great music. And they begin to sing. They haven't had singing lessons. This comes as a great surprise. So they start very tentatively with the theme. They gradually come into harmony with each other. The music becomes orchestral and choral. Uh, they're going great guns when one of their numbers says, I want to do my own thing, rebellion. And Melkor starts a counter theme to Eru's. He interrupts the music. So Eru says, all right, we'll start again. And stops the singing, starts it again, and again. This rebellious offspring uh, interrupts with his own theme. Eru finally throws up his hands. <laughs> we don't know whether he has hands or not. Um, but takes the interruptive theme and weaves it into his own music, which then becomes slow and beautiful and immeasurably sad. It is the template for the universe. Well, for Tolkien's, of course, and as he would have seen as, as, a, as a Roman Catholic, um, our own world, because that sounds very similar to the biblical account of God creating angels and one angel uh, but, rebelling but, against but God. But wait, um, the angel who rebels against God yes. in the Judeo-Christian story uh, comes in after creation, after the world is made. Tolkien's creation is fallen in its inception. The world is flawed before it's even made. That's a profound difference. Uh, and it really darkens the story. Right. Because what it means is not that you can repent, but that you're stuck with it. It's so there's a level of hopelessness in the it's Lord an of the Rings. I think there is. It's an interesting concept. Yes. Um, that the world as made is just flawed and beautiful even in its damaged state. Like the light when it is broken up. Splintered. 
right. when it is splintered. But then the next level right. oh, for that oh, title interrupted music. is that Tolkien's own music, his mythology that he worked on from 1917, was also interrupted over and over and over again by the events of his life. Right. By his work, by his family, World by War II. the wars. Right. Um, so his music has been interrupted again and again. And by his own death, of course, too. That it was finished and, well, and the Silmarillion was left stopped, incomplete. I guess. Right. Yeah. And in addition to the books you've written on Tolkien, you've also been, been to uh, a number of countries. Uh, England, Wales, which of course is part of Great Britain, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Italy, and Germany to be a guest at conferences centered around Tolkien. So there are, you could say, hundreds of millions of Tolkien fans around the world, um, or at least many, many millions. Do you, did you have a favorite country to visit to, to speak on Tolkien? If you, when you're thinking back to the countries you've been to? I think it would just be England because I was most comfortable with my own language there. But they were all wonderful. Finland was great. Finland was just lovely, but, but so was Wales, so was Germany. I got interesting different takes on Tolkien from each country. Right, and of course in Finland, we were talking earlier about the story from Finland, the yeah. Kalevala. 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 Yeah. And so that must have been interesting because you were going to the land where that work was created, yes. where it was inspired. Yes, where it was brought into being. And, and Tolkien loved that whole idea because how long has Greek mythology been around? Several thousand years, even more. Roman, um, Irish mythology has a history going way back. Finnish mythology actually came into world consciousness in 1835. Oh, so much later on. So it's much later. In that respect, it's newer, it's rawer. Uh, it hasn't been through as many filters as many interpreters, as many translations. Um, well, especially when Tolkien looked at it back in the early 1900s. <clears throat> when he also wanted to remove the one filter, which was translation, and try to read it in And it's Finnish. the original language. Yeah. Right. And so, besides having written books about Tolkien, uh, you received the great honor of being asked to edit two of Tolkien's previously unpublished works. So these are books by J.R.R. Tolkien that Professor Flieger edited, and then they were then published. Uh, works that before she edited them, and they, they had not been ever seen before um, by, by the reading public. So there's the story of... Kolervo. Kolervo. And another kind of interesting title, The Lay of Outru and Itrun, if I got that title yeah. right. So what, what significance do these two stories have to Tolkien's life, and were they at all connected to his creation of Middle-earth and his mythology of okay. his invented universe? Um, yes, they were. Okay. First of all, I, I need to get something straight. I was not invited to edit the story of Kullervo. I went to the estate and said, I've been reading this stuff at the Bodleian. It's dynamite. You mean it's the library? At in the library Oxford? in Oxford. It's okay. essential, I think, to our understanding of Tolkien's work. and. I would like the public to see it. And they gave me permission to, to bring the story of Kullervo um, to a wider public. It was a great privilege. Then they asked me to do 
the lay of Altru and Etrun. So it was kind of give and take. Right. Uh, but they were very kind in allowing me just to start um, to do the story of Kullervo. And I think it's the one essential to understanding Tolkien's whole concept of mythology. Um, Kullervo is the, the character of Kullervo is the sort of avatar of Tolkien's Turin Turambar, uh, the clear model um, that Tolkien used and, and brought into flower in a way. In the Silmarillion. In the Silmarillion uh, and in a long tale called The Lay of the Children of Horan, uh, which was published by Christopher Tolkien um, some, what, 10 years 14, ago? 14, yeah, long. Yeah, something like few that. Two years ago. Yeah. And what is The Lay of Altru and Itrun? It is Tolkien's adaptation of a Breton lay or poem. Poem. Uh, okay. called Autrunan Arhag Gargan. <laughs> Don't trust my Breton, please. <laughs> and what is, what language, what is Breton? What Breton region of the Celtic world is Breton is a Celtic language, like Irish, like okay. Welsh, okay. like Scots Gaelic. Okay. Um, and along about the same time that Finnish mythology was being collected, by Elias Lonrot, um, a man in Brittany, Ersart de la Ville Marque, uh, was collecting Breton myths. The 19th century was a big sort of surge of interest in learning about mythologies, right, the stories of countries and people. Well, it was consonant with the rise of nationalism. Now, nationalism kind of gets a bad rap. Uh, but in the 19th century, it was the evidence of a burgeoning consciousness of identity. Remember that Germany right. was just many states, many states until, until Otto von Bismarck united the yeah, country. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, Italy the same with city-states. Um, Ireland was an oppressed minority. Wanted to break away and from people Britain. And people in those polities, let's call them, turned to mythology uh, to give them an identity. In a way, it all started with the Brothers Grimm because they began collecting their fairy tales as a way of validating Germanic identity through language. See how it all comes back to language again and again. And then there was a great rush to look at the oldest levels of language in order to find the, the folk identity. That was true in Finland. It was true. I mean, it gave Finland uh, its identity. Finland got independence as a separate country in 1917, which is coincidentally when J.R.R. Tolkien began to write his mythology. Uh, the same with Brittany, which is still a part of France. Uh, but Tolkien amassed, when he was a young man, uh, started collecting books. He wanted to amass a library of um, works on language and the history of language because he felt that that's what he was doing too. And so the lay or poem of Autru and Etrun, is it, is it a story? Are these characters in the poem? Um, they are characters but the words actually simply mean Lord and Lady. Okay. They are unnamed. Uh, they are the protagonists of a tragic story. Uh, which Tolkien didn't invent, but which he kind of tweaked a little about a lord who procures a fertility potion from a mysterious lady with long golden hair 
who lives in a wood. Mm. Like Galadriel from the that? Lord of the Rings? All right, yes. Uh, the Corrigan. And Corrigan is just a Breton word for fairy. Okay. Elf, whatever. Uh, but Tolkien loved Ville Marquet. He had the two volume uh, edition of it. Um, I've seen it, it's in Oxford. Uh, and he adapted, he first tried translating it into English and then he sort of wanted to put his own spin on it. And that was the lay of our true and true. And we've said the, or you said the word tragedy, tragic, quite a few times now talking about Tolkien, and I haven't really thought that much about that theme of tragedy running through all of his books and his stories, but it really is. Yeah, and it is. do you think that had anything to do with the tragedy he, he experienced in his own life, whether it be through losing his parents or especially through experiences in World War I? That's a very astute question, and I have one simple answer. Yes. <laughs> I think it had everything to do with it. Uh, we tend to look at the jolly pipe-smoking professor sitting underneath a tree or in his academic robes, uh, and we forget that he was also a little boy who lost his father before he was three that when he was just on the cusp of adolescence, when he was 12, his mother died unexpectedly. She knew she was dying. Her boys did not. Um, so it made him an orphan. It made him an outsider. Uh, it was the great tragedy of his life. And it was just the first of Man. any number in World War I, as he said later on, all but two of his friends were dead by the end. These were dear friends. This was a fellowship. This was four guys who thought they could change the world. Um, Tolkien, Christopher Wiseman, G.B. Smith. Rob Gilson. And by the end of the war, G.B. Smith and Rob Gilson were dead. For, as Tolkien came to see it, no good reason that he could find. That's, that's profoundly sad because of the millions of other people who died in World War I. So for someone to come out of that saying, for apparently no reason, that's a bit sobering. That's you know, very makes you perceptive think. of you. Yes, it is. And I think it colored his whole life. I mean, he had a great sense of humor. Right. Uh, he loved a good Sitting with C.S. Lewis and, and his friends. and A gang of guys. Right. Uh, but the other side of it was a profound sadness at what he saw as a fallen world. What he characterized as a long defeat. And that's what his mythology is about. It's about an unwinnable war. And even though at the end of The Lord of the Rings the ring is destroyed and they win the battle at the Black Gate, what what do you mean by what do you mean by an unwinnable war? Well, I'm actually talking about the Silmarillion the greater not the Lord of the Rings um, it's the the war that comes out of the creation story he devised right. which has built into it error um, and evil and all of those things although I think he think I feel he would prefer a word like error um, because all things start with good and devolve uh, as they go along. Right. Uh, corruption creeps in. Right. People make mistakes. Um, you could say, um, 
and I've heard it said, that Eru makes a mistake in giving free will to his creator sub deities. In, in Tolkien's imaginary world. In his in his Silmarillion. Right. Yeah. And and so thinking about Tolkien's life and the historical events he experienced firsthand and the books he wrote, why do you think why do you think it's important for people to why do you think people should read his books and learn about his life? Well, I think people should read his books because they're wonderful. <laughs> um, by the way, I never recommend The Lord of the Rings to anyone because there are also people who despise his books. Um, and you never know. But I think for people who, who like them, they are very much the sort of thing you like. They've got a great story, wonderful characters, beautiful a, places, beautiful places, a, a profound trajectory, an arc of the story, um, and he's a good writer. Uh, he he does handle the English language very well. Yes, yes, and he he makes you he makes you feel. At least I got that sense when I read Lord of the Rings that you're really there a lot of times, that you're really in the forest and that you can see exactly what he's describing, especially because he puts, as you know, so much detail into the description of the landscapes and especially trees, right? The well, forest. That's the power of the word, isn't it? Right, and all back to, to create the theme. in your mind an image of a thing to, in a sense, take you there, um, that's what words are supposed to do. And he was a master at words. And I think, I don't think he's been bettered. He's been imitated, but I don't think he has been surpassed. And so, Ms. Flieger, what, what projects are you working on right now? Well, right now I'm I got very interested, apropos um, a couple of presentations that I gave to the Tolkien Society early in the year, with um, with the character of Arendelle, who is, as you probably know, one of Tolkien's earliest right, one of the first. manifestations. Um, and the more I've looked at it, the more I've, no, the more I've looked at it, the less I have seen. Um, Tolkien talked about the great tales of his mythology. Christopher Tolkien. His son. Published his son, um, the three, what, what are called the three great tales, the story of Baron and Luthien, the fall of Gondolin, the children of Hurin, the story of Turin Turambar. Um, but he also said, I'll, I'll do some of them in fullness, but I'll also leave tales just sketched, just placed in the scheme so you know where they fit. And I think that's what he did with the tale of Arundel which everybody says, what a shame he never got around to writing it. I'm beginning to think he never intended to get around to writing it. I think he wanted to leave a mystery, a tale. My friend and colleague Peter Grabowskis is going to be bringing out a book this fall um, from Kent State called The Untold Tales, of which I think the great one is the story of Arundel. And that'll be a book about Tolkien? It'll be a book about Tolkien's untold stories. The, the characters you d we don't hear the very much detail about. That we don't know about, like okay. Arundel, um, like Celeborn. Um, Galadriel's husband? Yeah. Right. Like um, 
oh, who's the guy at the Grey Havens? Kirdan, the shipwright. Yes. Um, and, and the stories that he refers to, like over there, uh, it's, it's that sense of distance. The, the things that are beyond the frame of the picture that he writes about that pique your curiosity. He wrote to, I think it was his son Michael, at one point it's the untold tales that are the real grabbers because they keep leading you on and on and on. Yes. And I think that he was clever enough to know that that would be, uh, that that should be a part of any mythology. Yes, well, an, an extraordinary man, and you are an extraordinary woman, Miss Flieger. You are extraordinary to say so, <laughs> and I thank you. So, Professor Flieger, what is your favorite meal? Ooh, lasagna. My dad loves lasagna. Uh, your dad is a man of taste. <laughs> How about your favorite movie? Oh, that's kind of harder. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I have a, a favorite movie. There were ones that I loved as a child. Snow White. Um, Did you see that when it, when it came out in theaters? I was... Right there, yes. I saw it when it first came out. And that was back in... 1938, 36. Right. Uh, the Wizard of Oz is another one. Uh, but there's so many modern movies. Um, two that I've seen in the past couple of years that I really like because they're not typical of the blockbuster are... Um, an animated version called Loving Vincent of the Life of Vincent Van Gogh. Van Gogh. Interesting. Uh, which is animation done in the style of the artist. So oh, okay. that it's as if you see Van Gogh's paintings coming to life. And I thought that was brilliant. Mm. And then a very quiet movie about two brilliant comics. Laurel and Hardy, called Stan and Ollie. Um, uh, it was black and white, uh, had marvelous actors. Um, and I loved that because it was so quiet. Mm. Just two guys trying to be funny. Mm. Interesting. And how about your favorite book? I'll give oh. you all <laughs> ten guesses on this one. Um, okay. I'll leave it up to you. What do you think is my okay, favorite may, book? Okay, maybe 20 to guess this one. Um, I don't know. Um, one, two, three, all together now. The, the Lord, Lord of, of the, the Rings. Rings. And Hobbit? Up less. Okay. Less so. Uh, I didn't read it before I read The Lord of the Rings. Right. I right. read The Lord of the Rings first. It just exploded in my eyes. Uh, and then I read The Hobbit, and I thought, eh, it's okay. Well, they have such a different feel, as you know. Different feel, feel when different you read tone, it. Right. Uh, all of that. And who's your favorite person from history? Someone you really admire from history? I, I think, really, it would be Queen Elizabeth I. The first? Yes. Yes. The great Elizabeth, the Renaissance, the Shakespeare. Elizabeth. I think she was an extraordinary person. She lived in an extraordinary period of her country's history and she affected it. Uh, and she overcame enormous handicaps. Her father killed her mother. Try right, that. Henry, Henry VIII. Henry VIII. Right. Um, she was vilified by the other party. Uh, she triumphed over all of those. And I started reading her when I was about 12, and I think that's a, that's a formative age. Right, right, just like the talking, the experiences, yeah, yeah that age. Yeah. And how about your favorite hobby? Reading. Reading. 
<laughs> Always reading? Yes. And do you enjoy writing? Do you enjoy the writing process? Writing is reading. Well, you're always going over the work you've done. No, you're reading the words on the page as they come out in front of you. Right. Um, it's, it's a two-way street. When you read, you are in your mind engaging with the author. Mm -hmm. um, but when you write, you are engaging with yourself. Yourself. Um, and it's when you read that you say, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Or, no, that's no good. We've got to start over. Here. Right. And arguing with yourself and sometimes. arguing with yourself. Like Smeagol and Gollum. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yes, very much. Yes, Precious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not a good passage, Precious. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody so much for watching the interview. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, please be sure to like this video and share it with all of your friends and also hit the subscribe button if you haven't already so you can stay up to date with all the videos on the History Bites YouTube channel. And until next time, go learn your history.